In the Midwest, a fugitive drug dealer will do anything to avoid capture. His desperate run is fueled by drugs and punctuated by gunfights. As he barrels across two states, local and federal authorities are determined to fight back and to stay in pursuit. enforcement officers become targets, no one is safe. So when a crystal meth dealer on the run from the law began shooting cops, it took more than police to stop him. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. With a fearless killer on the loose in the Midwest, residents had to help the FBI and state and local police bring down the dealer and deliver him to justice. On February 2nd, 2000, on the quiet back roads of Lincoln County, Nebraska, Lincoln County Sheriff's Deputy Stan McKnight was on routine patrol when he saw a vehicle rapidly approach from behind. A maroon pickup truck sped past. McKnight spotted Texas plates in the pickup, but he could not make out the numbers. The deputy began cautious pursuit. Recent weather conditions had created black ice on the roads. Without the benefit of street lights, the roads appeared normal, but were treacherously covered with patches of slick ice. Subject is now turning off on the side Deputy road. McKnight radioed for assistance. Please alert all available units. Several Nebraska State Patrol troopers mobilized to try to intercept the pickup. Whoever was in the truck seemed to have no regard for his own safety. Since the roads were free of other traffic and no one else was in danger, McKnight decided high-speed pursuit was not worth the risk. It appeared as though he knew the area that he was in and due to the fact that he would take more chances and drive faster than I would, he was able to disappear. Eventually, the truck vanished into the night. I had called in for assistance from uh, uh, the department and all the uh, deputies and state troopers were working, and we combed the whole area and, uh, looking for that vehicle, and uh, it was to no avail. Nebraska police issued a be on the lookout bulletin for the maroon pickup with Texas plates. But that night, no one spotted the vehicle or its driver. A week later, and 40 miles away in North Platte, Nebraska, deputies responded to a call from a farmer. He hadn't used his barn in years. So the farmer was surprised to discover someone had been working there recently, leaving a strange workplace behind. The deputies found chemicals and other items available in farm supply stores. They'd often seen this combination of materials in the area before. They were the ingredients needed to make methamphetamine an illegal drug. A powerful stimulant. Meth is also known as crank or speed. easy to make with materials commonly found on farms. In recent years, the Midwestern countryside has seen an epidemic of methamphetamine production, according to Lincoln County, Nebraska Sheriff's Corporal Casey Nelms. Methamphetamine labs are a problem because it's such a rural area. A lot of abandoned farmhouses, uh, farmsteads where people don't live anymore gives uh, opportunity for for these people to go in and, and manufacture 
this drug pretty much undetected. The drug is addictive and extremely dangerous. Users feel a temporary high, then intense paranoia and a craving for more. Most users become aggressive and desperate. When meth labs pop up in an area, violent crime follows. During their search of the meth lab in the North Platte barn, deputies found several pieces of mail. They were addressed to Charles Moses Jr. of Nakona, Texas. Deputies contacted Texas authorities asking for information on Moses. They received photos of Moses and learned there were warrants for his arrest for the theft of several firearms. Nebraska investigators also learned Moses drove a maroon pickup truck with Texas plates. The make and model of the truck matched the description of the one that had evaded Deputy McKnight only a week earlier. If Charles Moses was manufacturing methamphetamine, there was a good chance he was using it too. That might explain why Moses drove so recklessly on the night of the chase. The people that use this uh, become very paranoid. Um, they have no pain thresholds. Sometimes they're up for days. And it, it's, they're just a real problem. They're hard to handle. During their rounds in the tightly knit communities in the area, police showed the photo of Moses and asked if anyone had noticed an outsider fitting his description. Some residents reported seeing him in the past. We were pretty sure that uh, he was in the area. But no one had seen him in several days, and Moses had no local address. At 11 p.m. on February 12, 2000, a week after the meth lab was discovered, Lincoln County Corporal Casey Nelms was about to start his shift as was his routine, he picked up a cup of coffee before hitting the road. But that night would prove to be anything but routine. Through the window, Nelm spotted a vehicle that matched the description of Charles Moses's pickup truck. Well, have a good night. You too. But he needed to get a look at the driver. When he got out of the pickup, uh, he resembled the individual that we were looking for. The truck had Texas plates. Seven to one six, 1089. Nelms headed out to check the man's ID. But the man spoke first. What are the roads like out there? They're pretty slick. Where are you heading? Uh, just, just kind of heading out, just going out. Uh, I approached him and asked him uh, if he was, where he was going, what he was doing. Uh, I asked him for his identification, and when he handed it to me, uh, the name on the driver's license was Charles Moses. You're under arrest. I really expected that once I got a hold of him in the vehicle, that I was going to be able to, you know, take him out of the vehicle without any problem and place him under arrest. But uh, he was just uh, spectacularly strong. I just couldn't do anything with him, uh, except just keep struggling with him to try to keep the weapon away from my face. Moses fired. Cars parking lot. Shots fired. I was pretty sure two of my rounds hit. The second round, I saw it hit the back of the cab, and the third round, it also hit the back of the cab. Nelms tried to follow Moses, but the fugitive drove with the recklessness of a man on methamphetamine and disappeared. Nebraska State Patrol officers heard the shots fired call and joined the search for the would-be cop killer. Lincoln County Sheriff's Deputy Stan McKnight, who had chased the maroon truck before, heard about the pursuit on the radio. 
he needed to position himself in a place where he was likely to intercept Moses. There's an area that's commonly called the correction line. It's an area where I could see the best I thought possible, three different roads intersecting that area. And that was the middle one. I could watch a mile behind me, that one, and a mile in front of me. McKnight waited in the dark, hoping he was in the right place. After about 10 or 15 minutes of sitting there, a vehicle did come from the west at the very road intersection that I was at. And as they got right to the front of my vehicle, I turned my headlights on and I saw the vehicle that was the same identical vehicle that I'd seen less than two weeks before. He was traveling in excess of 70 to 80 mile an hour and being nighttime conditions, it was hard to see him and he was out of distance me quite rapidly. Deputy McKnight tried to maintain a visual on the pickup truck. But the vehicle seemed to disappear yet again. McKnight changed tactics. At that point, he had pretty much, well, got ahead of me. At the same time, I had to slow down and check driveways and intersecting road intersections to make sure he hadn't turned off on me. Then the deputy saw a vehicle's brake lights in the distance. It was idling at an empty intersection. Deputy McKnight called for backup. Moses had already fired at one officer. It was too dangerous for the deputy to advance alone. He waited for the backup officers. Before they came, Moses made his move. One bullet entered Stan McKnight's head. Another ripped through his hand. Upon uh, figuring out that I'd been hit by a bullet, I was going to try to call to the rest of the officers around to let them know what was going on. Only when I reached for the mic, I couldn't talk. My mouth was all full of blood and I was starting to choke. So I felt around and I found some napkins in the seat and I got them shoved up in my mouth to make the blood go out and I got it spit out and then I could talk and let them know that I'd been hit and that the subject had went on to the left and was going to be chasing him. Despite his injuries, Deputy McKnight was not going to give up his pursuit. The wind was coming through the holes in the windshield, blowing glass all over. My left eye was completely shut from blood. My right eye was just blinking, but I could still see enough of my headlights to keep going down the road. Based on the coordinates McKnight radioed, several teams of Nebraska State Patrol troopers headed towards stakeout positions in the area. They drove with their headlights and flashers off so they wouldn't alert Moses. Troopers in two cars positioned themselves on a dark county road and waited. Minutes later, headlights appeared. It was Moses. One of the troopers spotted a gun. losing blood fast. The chest wound appeared to be life-threatening. They called for an ambulance from a hospital dozens of miles away.
In the dark prairie, the troopers hoped their fallen friend would survive. In a frantic escape, Charles Moses had shot both a sheriff's deputy and a state trooper. Though gravely injured, Deputy McKnight continued pursuit of Moses, a man willing to kill to stay on the run. In February of 2000, Nebraska authorities confronted Charles Moses, a Texas fugitive suspected of running a methamphetamine lab. Escaping, he led police on a high-speed chase, shooting one deputy in the head and a state trooper in the chest before vanishing into the night. Paramedics stabilized the wounded trooper, then transported him to the nearest emergency room. Helping to process the crime scene was Nebraska State Patrol Sergeant Lynn Williams. We secured the area, and then our major concern was obviously the gathering of evidence. So we collected uh, the trooper's service pistol, his uh, duty and gun belt, uh, spent shell casings that were still at the scene. Uh, we took 35 millimeter photographs, uh, videotaped the, the scene. Moses had fired several bullets. One struck the cruiser's reflective seal, perhaps the only thing visible on the dark prairie. The bullet had uh, passed through the door of the trooper's patrol car, uh, had struck the trooper in the abdomen, uh, piercing his bulletproof vest, as well as traveling through his body. To get through that much protection, the gun Moses used against police had to be a powerful one. It was obvious that this was a high-powered rifle. Uh, we were looking for uh, some sort of an assault rifle, something uh, large bore, high-powered. The state police brought the spent rifle slugs to their ballistics lab for analysis. Technicians there examined the size, weight, and metal composition of the slugs. They determined they were high-velocity rounds, most likely fired from a 762 SKS military assault rifle. Deadly weaponry designed for trained military personnel, something else entirely in the hands of a criminal. After the multiple cop shooting, the FBI joined the effort to capture Moses. Special Agent Ron Graywall took the call at the normally quiet North Platte, Nebraska FBI resident agency. Our caseload primarily is in the area of white collar crime, and it's not very common that we get called in to assist in investigations of violent criminal activity. Agent Raywald gathered information to obtain an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant against Moses. In this particular case, we anticipated that Moses would leave the state of Nebraska after he fled his arrest and that the FBI could assist in locating him. Hoping to catch Moses before he left Nebraska, authorities set up a command center at a state police barracks. Officers from virtually every law enforcement agency in the state shared intelligence on Moses. Several had had run-ins with him, usually in connection with clandestine meth labs. He had a history of using abandoned farm farmsteads, farm places, uh, not only for the manufacture of methamphetamine, but for hiding and living as well. So we knew that we needed to, to be aware of this and target those areas for a search. Hundreds of police vehicles across the state mobilized, with officers looking for any sign of Charles Moses or his maroon pickup truck. In the sprawling rural landscape, finding Moses would not be easy. Moses Jr. was last seen wearing a light-colored winter Investigators hat. also hoped the public would assist in the search. Media bulletins urged citizens to avoid Moses and to call the police if they spotted him. In the small town of Dickens, Nebraska, 30 miles south of where the two officers were shot, 
a young farmer found tire tracks leading to a garage. His parents' car was usually inside. Instead, there was a maroon pickup truck. His parents' car was gone. Recognizing the truck from media reports, the farmer called police. The Nebraska State Patrol confirmed that the truck belonged to Charles Moses and that officers had hit the vehicle when returning fire. The license plate that we were looking for uh, was still displayed on the truck, which was registered to Mr. Moses. Uh, it had evidence uh, that it had been shot at with a firearm. The bullet holes were in the back uh, portion of the cab. They had shattered the back window of the cab. Uh, some had lodged uh, in the dash of the cab, and some had passed uh, out through the front windshield. Make sure you get this wheel. Investigators also found evidence the suspect was wounded by at least one of the many shots fired at the vehicle. We located uh, human blood in the, in the cab, the interior of the pickup. That led us to believe that possibly uh, when the Lincoln County deputy had fired at, at Moses, early on during the incident that possibly he had been struck. But if Moses was injured, he had the perfect drug to stay alert, pain-free and aggressive, to keep running without sleep. There was a tremendous amount of paraphernalia located in his pickup uh, that deals with cooking or the manufacture of methamphetamine. He virtually had a, had a lab present uh, in the back of the truck. Investigators also found survivalist gear, police radios, and weapons in the truck. What they didn't find was the high-powered assault rifle Moses used to shoot two police officers. An hour after the pickup was found, and 60 miles northwest in Ogallala, Nebraska, the Nebraska State Patrol responded to a call from a man who said he was an acquaintance of Charles Moses. The man said he had seen Moses 15 minutes earlier. Moses spoke to him at a truck stop. He was in a car that matched the description of the vehicle missing from the Dickens farm. While they talked, Moses heard a radio bulletin that said police were looking for the vehicle. If you see this vehicle, call state I gotta get out here, man. He panicked and took off. The man said he had waited 15 minutes to call police because he was afraid at first. The dangerous fugitive knew where his family lived. Police worried Moses would change vehicles again to throw them off his trail. Two hours after the last sighting, and 20 miles south of the truck stop in Paxton, Nebraska, a farmer noticed fresh tire tracks outside a house on his family's farmstead, a house that was closed up and unused. He called his family to ask if anyone had been to the house. They hadn't, but they told him about the bulletins, warning of a dangerous fugitive in the area. They said he should leave the place immediately. A relative on the line heard the farmer talking to someone. Police would soon learn that Charles Moses had just claimed his first murder victim. The deadly fugitive was still on the run. Now, more desperate than ever. On February 14, 2000, 36 hours after fugitive Charles Moses seriously wounded two Nebraska law enforcement officers, a murder investigation began in Paxton, Nebraska. The victim was a local farmer, killed while talking to a relative on his cell phone. The investigative team had to piece together the murder from crime scene clues. The circumstances indicated Charles Moses was involved to Nebraska State Police Sergeant Lynn Williams. 
We had learned that the victim had drove in the abandoned farmstead to, to check on tire tracks that he observed. Uh, we believed that he surprised Moses and Moses reacted with that surprise and shot the victim, killing him. Uh, Moses then drug the victim from the victim's pickup, placed him on the ground, and Moses then got back in the victim's pickup and left the scene. Troopers found tracks consistent with those on the model of truck the farmer drove, as well as broken glass from the truck on one side of the driveway. The position of the glass suggested the vehicle's driver's side window had been blown out. FBI Special Agent Ron Raywalt knew the glass was an important clue. I anticipated that Moses would try and use a defense of self-defense, stating that he was returning fire from someone shooting at him. I knew that I could determine how many shots were fired and the direction that the shots originated from. When a high-speed projectile hits a piece of glass and the glass breaks, physical characteristics are left in the glass. This answers questions for the crime scene investigator. It tells them which bullet hit first and the direction of travel of the bullet. The glass would be examined later in the lab. Behind a barn on the property, investigators found the stolen car that Moses was last seen driving. The car seemed hastily abandoned. In the back seat, troopers found chemicals, knives, and several firearms. It appeared that Moses had switched vehicles after he heard a radio report that police were looking for this car. It was very obvious that Mr. Moses had been attempting to hide or camouflage, conceal the vehicle. Uh, it had a tarp over it, and Moses was in the process of covering the vehicle with broken and dead uh, branches, uh, tree branches, and that, that sort of stuff. Investigators found the victim's identification, but they couldn't find the cell phone he was using when he was murdered. They believed Moses had the phone with him in the farmer's blue pickup truck. They issued an APB for the vehicle and contacted cell phone companies to begin tracking the cell phone's signal. While powered on, cell phones are constantly in search of the nearest tower to be ready for use. Police can flag a specific phone number and learn which tower is serving it. Two hours after the farmer's murder was discovered, a cell phone tower in Oshkosh, Nebraska, picked up the signal from the missing phone. But before police could respond to the location, the cell phone signal disappeared. The FBI also studied the glass fragments from the Farmstead crime scene. I was able to determine that one bullet had been fired from outside the truck into the truck and that the bullet thereafter passed through the truck. My examination further disclosed that no shots were fired from inside the truck. This was not self-defense. This was murder. Take a look at this. With the farmer's murder and the theft of his pickup truck, the FBI issued another federal warrant against Charles Moses. The facts of the case had changed significantly, and I was able to change the warrant application process to charge Mr. Moses with the federal carjacking statute with a homicide. Uh, lock their doors. With Charles uh, Moses crisscrossing the state, armed and out of control, Nebraska Governor vehicles, Mike Johans held a news conference to I warn just the think, public. Uh, this is a situation that we need to get through. Police are seeking Charles Moses. It was clear the fugitive was ready to kill civilians to get what he wanted. He's considered armed and dangerous. That evening, 80 miles to the west, near the Nebraska-Wyoming border, an elderly woman was enjoying a quiet evening. She heard someone breaking in through a door.
you could hear an intruder walking through the house, then approaching her bedroom. It was too late to escape, so she did her best to hide. The evening news had said Moses killed the last resident he surprised. It sounded like he was looking for something, and then left. The woman was unharmed and called police from a neighbor's house. She explained that she never saw the man's face. But deputies from the Scotts Bluff, Nebraska Sheriff's Department found tire tracks consistent with those on the pickup truck stolen from the murdered farmer. They also recovered automotive glass near the left tire track. Its position suggested it came from the driver's side window. The window investigators believe Moses shot out while killing the farmer. Local officers contacted the FBI about the new development. From the facts of the case and the type of glass left at that crime scene, it was obvious that Moses had been involved in that burglary and that he was traveling in a westerly direction. Moses, and we got his physical description. With Charles Moses believed to be near Nebraska's western border, the FBI notified Wyoming law agencies that a killer might be headed their way. The small town of Lusk, Wyoming, is 20 miles from the Nebraska border. At the Lusk Police Department, Chief Gary Gill received the FBI bulletin. That morning, we heard about Charles Moses from our dispatch. We knew that he was driving a Nebraska pickup truck, blue in color, and that he could be headed in any direction. The Wyoming media warned the public about the fugitive. Around 1 p.m. that afternoon, the media alerts paid off. We heard about the call from a truck driver who had called into dispatch and was relayed to our office that uh, possibly that pickup truck Charles Moses was driving was at the south end parking lot of the truck stop here in Lusk. Assistant Chief Dusty Christman responded to the scene along with Chief Gill. Several vehicles in the parking lot fit the description. Officers knew one of them might hold a murderer who also tried to kill two policemen. We were looking at license plates. We spotted a blue pickup that had matched the description. The plates matched. It was the truck. We decided to try to block him in if we could. The officers approached from opposite directions. Someone was inside, but the officers couldn't tell if it was Moses. The truck's driver's side window appeared to be missing. If it was Moses, he might have finally come down off a long and haggard methamphetamine binge. Chief Gill called for backup and waited for more units to arrive. Two, this would be the vehicle I think we're looking for. Then the driver woke up. He's waking up, he's gonna take off. 
but Assistant Chief Chrisman couldn't risk firing because from his perspective, he did not get a good enough look to be absolutely sure it was Moses. It meant another chase. Our biggest fear during the chase is when Moses turned onto Main Street and headed north. We knew he was gonna be traveling through our business district and more than likely a high rate of speed. And also the fear of maybe losing him once he got through the city limits and head north on Highway 85. Weeks after Charles Moses' violent spree began, law enforcement once again had him in their sights. After eluding Nebraska authorities and the FBI, suspected murderer Charles Moses had crossed into Lusk, Wyoming. Lusk police were in pursuit. But Moses had a lead on him and never hesitated for a moment. Mr. Moses finally got away from us off Highway 85 onto our ranch road. The road was very uh, rutted up. Our small vehicles with two-wheel drive could not keep up with him in four-wheel drive in the pickup he had. He went down to a ranch place and across a old dam and up into the pastures through fences and things where we couldn't chase him. Authorities lost him again. So Lux police teamed with the Niobrara County Sheriff's Department. Sheriff Samuel Reed helped devise a 10-mile perimeter to contain Moses. The perimeter uh, was a very large area. We were fortunate in one way. It sat kind of in the middle of, of uh, three major highways. Uh, and and with, we had another county road that dissected it basically in the middle. But they couldn't rush in. We were unsure what his actions were going to be. Uh, so we, we stayed back away knowing that he had a high powered rifle. Every law enforcement officer in the area, including fish and game wardens, manned roadblocks to look for Moses and warned travelers to stay away from him. They also met with residents living in the 10 mile perimeter, asking them to stay vigilant and call police at the first sign of any suspicious activity. I had a very deep concern that if we did not apprehend Moses before it got dark, that we would have a terrible, terrible time finding him. I knew the ranch people that were there. I was very, very concerned for their safety of him entering the house at gunpoint, uh, taking him hostage and shooting them and taking a vehicle and leaving the area. Although Moses was somewhere within the 10 mile perimeter, the terrain made it too dangerous for deputies to go in on foot. Without body armor and tactical training, they would be vulnerable to ambush or a sniper attack. For officers to go in there would have been extremely difficult. There are a lot of deep draws, pine trees, ravines that he could get down in. Uh, it would have been very, very, very difficult to go in there and find him. Thanks. Special Agent Ron Raywald helped Wyoming authorities with the FBI's federal resources. The Wyoming office of the FBI brought in two aircraft to assist in the search on the state highways and the rural roads trying to locate the vehicle Moses was in. Flying a grid pattern over the area, one of the aircraft spotted the truck Moses was last seen driving. looked like it was stuck in a ravine. A SWAT team from the Nebraska State Patrol was airlifted to the area. Moses was armed with a high-powered rifle. The SWAT team had to move cautiously, man by man. An aggressive fugitive on powerful drugs could be behind any tree ready to kill. They positioned themselves above the pickup. But they had no visual of Charles Moses. He might be watching them, waiting for a clean shot. 
They had to start their search from the truck. To stun and distract anyone near it, they fired a flashbang percussion grenade. He wasn't That's there. Good, they found footprints in the mud by the truck and began following them. But in the trees, the trail went cold. He had eluded us, uh, the, the people that were right on the scene. He had eluded a SWAT team that had been flowing in out of Nebraska. That night, Moses would surface again. At 8.30 p.m., rancher Jim Kramers and his son Justin heard their dog barking at something behind the house. They knew about Moses, so Justin went out armed. Someone was out there. I've got a gun. Don't go any further. From the brief look, they believed it was Moses. The gunman had to be stopped. Justin, take your rifle, go around back, get on the back side of him, and then you do what you have to do. Okay? Kramers was unarmed in a standoff with a desperate fugitive who had never hesitated to use violence. The rancher had a plan and hoped it would work. In eastern Wyoming, a rancher and his son found fugitive Charles Moses on their property. From media reports, rancher Jim Kramers knew Moses was wanted for shooting several police officers and killing a farmer for his truck. Justin, you know, on the back side Justin Kramers went to cover Moses from the back. The father risked his life, hoping to end the fugitive's rampage without more violence. I was totally unarmed. Um, Moses had a rifle and a large caliber pistol in his hands. Hoping his son could protect him if his plan failed, Jim Kramers offered Moses a deal. He knew the fugitive had been exposed to the day's cold rain showers. If Moses put down the guns and came inside, the rancher would give him a hot meal and throw his clothes in the dryer. This was a plan in my head that if I got him in the house, uh, I had nothing to fear from him because we would know that he had no weapons. It was too cold and and if he ran out of the house without any of his clothes with him, why, he was not going to be in good shape. I very seldom invite someone into my house that I don't ask them to eat, so I knew he was hungry, so I said, let's have something to eat. If they got him inside, they would try to call the police without him knowing. By this time, Justin Kramers had Moses in his sights. It looked like Moses was going for it. Then he tensed. All right, I put my rifle down now. Where's the other guy you're with? Right behind you. Jim Kramers hoped Moses would not draw his son into his violence. My greatest concern uh, throughout the, the ordeal was that my son would not have to shoot someone. I didn't want him, you know, justly or unjustly, I did not want him to have to go through life knowing that he had killed a person. If it did turn violent, Justin could not waver. Justin! One of the fears I had was if I did have to shoot at him that I might miss. I only had one shot while he had up to six in his pistol where I had a single-shot rifle. After weeks of a methamphetamine-induced rampage, yeah. 
Charles Moses finally slowed down. All right, let's go on into the house. We'll get your food. He left his weapons outside. I never actually lowered my rifle. I, I brought it down a small ways, but w within quick enough time enough that I could have brought it back up to put on him if I needed to. Inside the warm house and out of his wet clothes, Moses concentrated on his first hot meal in days. I was able to go out the front door of the house and was gone for around five minutes while I called the sheriff from my brother's house and then I was able to come back in the same door while he never realized I was gone. What's going on, Jim? A Lusk police officer and a Wyoming game warden were there in minutes. Because of the Kramer's plan, the wild, deadly fugitive had nothing to fight with. After a staggering chase across hundreds of miles, filled with burglary, carjacking, gunfights, and murder, Charles Moses Jr. was finally in police custody. As they theorized, Moses had been wounded by Nebraska deputies. At a Cheyenne, Wyoming hospital, Moses was treated for a bullet wound to his shoulder, dehydration, and exhaustion. The drugs he had taken, and the police relentlessly on his trail, had run him into the ground. FBI Special Agent Ron Raywalt arranged for Moses to be transported back to Nebraska. The morning after the arrest, when I drove to Cheyenne, Wyoming, I took a lieutenant with the Nebraska State Patrol with me, and I took Deputy Casey Nelms with me, the individual that had attempted to initiate the arrest originally. The purpose of taking these two individuals with me was uh, so that when I returned to Nebraska with Moses, both individuals could affect the respective warrants that they were carrying. The lieutenant from the patrol arrested Moses for the violation of shooting a Nebraska State Patrol trooper, and Casey Nelms arrested Moses for the murder of the farmer as well as the assault by shooting of the two deputies from Lincoln County. Moses initially fought the charges against him, but when confronted with ballistics and other forensic evidence, he plea bargained to avoid the death penalty. Charles Moses Jr. pleaded no contest to second-degree murder and two counts of assault on a police officer. He was sentenced to 190 years in prison. The state trooper Moses shot returned to light duty in June of 2000. Moses had also shot Lincoln County Sheriff's Deputy Stan McKnight in the head and hand. He spent nearly two months in the hospital. Never willing to give up, McKnight was determined to return to his regular patrol. I had to go back for several different operations with a total of nine operations and 23 months of continuing therapy. After the doctors had stated that they had done all that they could for me, I was checked and we went through all the physical dexterity and I was able to go back to work and maintain and do what I was doing before. Methamphetamine has become the biggest drug problem in the Midwest. Law enforcement there are dedicated to fight it, whatever the cost.